Good evening. I want to welcome you all to the Rally for Jobs, Diversity, and Opportunity. My name is Kyle Acock. I am the president of Young Americans for Liberty here at LSU. I will be your MC for the evening. In an election year, hearing about ideas and candidates is perhaps the best way to ready ourselves to step into the voting booth this November. As voters, it is our duty to consider all options before making a decision on our candidates. Our speakers tonight will hopefully go a long way to introducing and explaining ideas not currently in the national debates. First up tonight, we have Lauren O'Halloran from Americans for Fair Taxation. Next, we will have Professor Walter Block from the Loyola New Orleans Economics Department. And lastly, we have Libertarian Party presidential candidate, Governor Gary Johnson. <laughs> During Governor Johnson's speech, I encourage you to submit questions for the governor via Twitter using the hashtag LSUVotes. Your best questions will be asked follow the governor, following the governor's speech. After a short video, Lauren O'Halloran will take the stage to uh, talk about the fair tax. Thank you.
relaxation. How are you? Thank you for coming out here on this rainy day and uh, being here. This is my first time speaking at LSU at uh, this type of venue. Um, I have a, a little slide presentation to uh, give you uh, an overview of the fair tax and how it works and how it will be implemented. Uh, Americans for Fair Taxation basically is a grassroots nonprofit 501c4 organization out of Houston, Texas. And uh, we are not endorsing any candidates. However, uh, Governor Gary Johnson is the third presidential candidate to endorse uh, the fair tax for his platform. We have candidates all over the country at state and federal level uh, endorsing the fair tax, making it part of their platform. Uh, and hopefully uh, I can explain a few things, uh, clarify a few things for you so that uh, you know what it is that they're trying to uh, promote. Uh, there will be a question and answer session afterwards, so if you can hold your questions uh, until we are done, um, I would appreciate it. Okay. The current uh, federal tax system that we have right now with the IRS Boo. I know we all went up like Boo. the IRS. Boo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we pay individual taxes on income, corporate taxes, and taxes on consumption. We have those ugly value-added taxes where we're paying for our corporations. Uh, their burden is passed down to us when we go to the store and buy their products. Our option with the fair tax is not just tax reformation. This is an option to replace it, scrap the entire system, and replace it with a completely new system. The Fair Tax Act of 2011, uh, it's Bill Number HR 25 and it's Senate Bill Number 13, it was first introduced in 1999 with the uh, same number of Democrats as Republicans who uh, introduced it, and today we have over 80 co sponsors in Washington. Um, Americans for Fair Taxation is solely dedicated to replacing America's income tax system with the Fair Tax Act of 2011. I'm going to go over the proponents of the bill, the research, uh, the features and how it works, the timeline, how it will be implemented, and also the benefits of the fair tax uh, that our economic system uh, will, will have and uh, who opposes it and the resources where you can get some more information. I always tell people what we have is taxation without comprehension, um, which is true. We've got over 73,000 pages in our current tax code. If you can imagine 147 reams of paper stacked up, how tall that would be, that's how many pages we have in the tax code. It's good visualization. Uh, once Obamacare is in place, that's another uh, five reams of paper added to it. So if you take 152 reams of paper, stack it up, that's what we've got for our tax system. It's full of loopholes, it's full of uh, exemptions, and the entire angle of the system is all the exemptions where our government can uh, choose, pick the winners and losers in the industry. We also have, uh, I just caught this from a, a textbook from Southeastern University, and some of you may already know how tax reductions and simplifications uh, increase the GDP, lower price levels, whenever we uh, reform our tax system. Okay. And the Fair Tax Act of 2011, basically it replaces the man, everything's going to be 23% more expensive. No, it's not true. With value-added taxes, basically you're paying, on average, 22% to the federal government already. We're going to be pulling all of that out and replacing it with the 23% on top. And I'm going to show you how, how that would be uh, when you go to the register to pay for it. Uh, and like I said, we do have 80 co-sponsors in the House and Senate. Two of the co-sponsors are from here in Louisiana. We've got Congressman John Linder. We've also got Rodney Alexander. Uh, they are longtime uh, co-sponsors to the bill. And we've also got uh, a, an open letter to Congress.
Congress that was written in 1999, which was endorsed by professors here in Louisiana. Over 80 economists and professors wrote this letter to, to Congress. And I'm going to give you their names here. Two of them were from LSU, one from Tulane, and one from UL Monroe. Uh, David Bressington from LSU, Dr. Jerry Ingram, who's a professor of economics and finance <coughs> at UL Monroe, Christopher Combs at LSU, and Franklin Lopez from Tulane University. And over 80, these 80 economists and professors, they wrote this open letter to Congress, was in 1999, endorsing the fair tax stating why this is what our economy needs. Now, of course, the parent tax is going to replace all income-based taxes, uh, personal and corporate income taxes, estate taxes, gift taxes, alternative minimum tax, the capital gains, self-employment, Medicare and Social Security. And if you remember back in the 90s, there was this commercial where there was this teenager, he's got his job for the first time, he's all happy, he's very proud, he gets his very first paycheck, this is back in the day when we actually got paper stubs. And uh, he opens it up, he looks at it, he's all excited, and he says, Who is FICA? And why is he taking my money? And uh, so everybody remembers that commercial back in the 90s. So um, basically, FICA is a big chunk taken out of our, our wages. And uh, these days, now we don't get that, those paper stubs. It's all taken out electronically, we don't see it, we don't feel it. All we know is that we get that bottom line number in our bank account at the end of the month. We're happy. I would challenge each one of you who, who are wage earners, who are investors, who are savers, take a look at your stocks, take a look at your information, see how much the government is taking out. Because I'm sure that you would be pretty surprised at uh, everything that is, that is happening uh, to your paychecks. Um, and we know what's happening to, to Medicare and Social Security today. So where's that money really gone? This is uh, another uh, page I took out of the textbook to basically show how value-added taxes are, are uh, how we are paying them. 22 cents of every dollar that we're paying, from the cotton farmer to L.L. Bean when we buy a shirt from them. $7.70 of that $35 are value-added taxes. Those are corporate taxes that we're paying. Even though we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world, we're the ones paying it when we go to the register. And this is just a visualization about uh, how when we go to pay for an item at Walmart, we buy something for 100 bucks. Right now, with our current system, we have embedded taxes, all these hidden taxes that can be raised, changed for whatever reason that we do not know. Uh, we're paying for property, plant, and equipment, raw materials and labor, marketing, sales, supply chain, and for all those costs that are embedded with the overhead that is passed down to the consumer. And those are in the price. Then we've got taxes exclusively once we get to the cash register. So $100 isn't what we're really paying for uh, the, uh, the item. We're paying a lot more than we think we are. And under the fair tax, it's going to be transparent because it's inclusive, meaning that when you see the item on the shelf and it says $100, that's the price that you're going to pay what you see on the shelf at the register. $23 of that $100 is going to go to the federal government. $77 will go to the retailer. They'll be itemized on your receipt when you pay for, the, for that item. And uh, uh, it's very transparent. And this is how we can keep an, an eye on Congress. They can't raise it. Doesn't matter what your income is. They don't know who you are. They don't know how you make your money. They don't know if you're in this country legally, illegally, if you're earning your income legally or illegally. Uh, everybody, no matter where you're located, pays the same flat amount across the board. And the, pre the prebate is basically the component of the bill uh, that is uh, essential to making it the fair tax. 
Um, prebate keeps it non-regressive because someone who is at poverty level in line at Walmart paying for the same thing as a millionaire. Yeah, there are millionaires at Walmart. I've seen it before. Um, it's not fair for someone at poverty level to give up the same amount of their income as a millionaire to pay for the same thing. And the prebate is a way to make this like a freedom bill. The government gives you back directly uh, a rebate on necessities. And those, necessi those necessities are uh, shelter, food, utilities. And basically they take census information. Um, April 15th is just another day. There's no more reporting. The government does not know who you are. Uh, but basically they go by the number of your, uh, how many people are in a household. And the Department of uh, Health and Human Services uh, does, a, uh, does research every year to determine how much each household uh, pays for utilities and uh, shelter and food um, each month based on the number of people in the household. And it breaks it down by the, fair, by the fair tax rate, breaks it down each month at the beginning of the month, you get that rebate back uh, in cash and you get to decide how you're going to spend that money. But the, two, the other component, um, the other function of the prebate is that it keeps the lobbyists out of Washington. Half of the lobbyists in Washington are tax lobbyists. They're the ones that are trying to figure out all the loopholes for the corporations. All the deductions, all the credits, everything, and basically trading all of the favors with congressmen, empowering them uh, and by using the IRS code. So, with the prebate, it gets rid of all of that. Um, most people say, well, why can't we just not tax food? Don't tax shelter, don't tax utilities. Well, once we do that, we open the door to lobbyists against saying, well, if their product is exempt, why can't ours? So uh, this basically gives the money back to you directly. And they, basically this guy here will show um, how, you know, those at poverty level pay less tax with the prebate. Uh, the 29000 basically was what poverty level was at last year. Now it's at 30000 uh, if you're a millionaire, you end up paying more for more tax on necessities, whereas those at poverty level will pay less. This is my favorite part. How it's going to be collected is that the businesses only need to fill out one piece of paper. They attach a check for the tax that they collected. They even get to keep a quarter of a percent of what they collected. For their, for their troubles. They turn that over to the states. The states are empowered to collect federal revenue. I'm going to say that again. The states are empowered to collect federal revenue. That's a good thing. <laughs> and uh, the, those of you that are fans of Governor Johnson, you understand how important that is, that we need to empower the states as much as possible and take that, take that power away from the federal government. The states do the same thing. They collect the, the money from the businesses. They fill out one piece of paper, attach a check on it. They get to keep a quarter of a percent for their troubles and turn it into a bureau that's 10% of the size and budget of the IRS. Right now it takes over $8 billion to run the IRS. The fair tax will free up that $8 billion. We also pay almost $400 billion alone just to comply with the IRS, just to pay our taxes, we're giving up $400 billion. And that's businesses and individuals. Once uh, Obamacare is in place, it's going to shoot up to over $600 billion. And uh, the statistics from Americans for Tax Reform also state that uh, businesses pay $724 for every $100 they actually pay in taxes. So uh, it, it's outrageous, the money that we're losing uh, just, just to comply with the IRS. What could we do with all that money freed up? The timeline of the transition. Once, pa once it's passed and made into law, 
2013 in February is going to be the 100th anniversary of the 16th Amendment. The 100th an anniversary. And it would be very nice to pass something like this where we can actually repeal the 16th Amendment. There's a resolution, one page resolution attached to the bill that will allow that amendment to be repealed fully within seven years. As of January 1st, 2014, after it passes in 2013, January uh, 1st of 2014, the IRS will close its doors. They will have five years to close out their books. Your very first paycheck in 2014 will be much fatter immediately. And in 2021, uh, according to the resolution, there's a deadline, a seven-year deadline that I'm not even worried about because the fair tax is, is so promising that most of the states are going to have it implemented at state level already. Uh, we've already got seven states that are working on it within their state legislatures, I think. South Carolina is probably going to be the first state to implement it. But once we get uh, all the states, two-thirds of the states on board, uh, the 16th Amendment will be repealed. But if, if not, as of uh, December 31st on the, of that seventh year, we revert back to the old system and the fair tax is no more. That way we will not have a consumption and an income tax at the same time. Okay, some of the benefits. Um, we've got over $15 trillion sitting in offshore accounts by corporations and by the uber wealthy. Uh, it's legal, they can do it. I don't blame them. Uh, the IRS chases that money out of our country. And, you know, if we got rid of the IRS, all that money would be free to be re repatriated back into our economy. Even if, if part of that were to come back, it would be a great benefit. Our exports will gain a superior competitive advantage at least 10%. They will increase. Um, U.S. becomes a corporate headquarter haven, uh, meaning jobs. How many of you remember the Made in the USA label? Just like in the video. We're going to have our jobs back. No more calling India for tech support. And uh, also, uh, we have visitors that come here within our borders for, you know, tourists, anybody who buys within our borders will contribute. We also have the underground economy. This is going to be a revenue stream that we've never tapped into before. Trillions of dollars that we're going to be able to tap into to replace the income tax. Illegal aliens, we got our pimps and hoes, people get cash, whatever, however they're making their money, doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> Uh, they're all going to get to contribute. And at the same time, it's not going to raise the price. If you have you know, faith in the free market system, once those value-added taxes are ripped out of the price of the products, what's going to happen? The price is going to fall. So uh, basically, in the medical industry, right now you're paying value-added taxes on average 29%. When you build a new home, value-added taxes basically around 19%. So it's a little bit lower than the 23. How many times in your life do you build a home? Uh, so it's, it's going to be comparable. Uh, the prices are not going to be raised anymore uh, by 23%. And everybody's going to be able to contribute. The important thing is that we widen, we broaden the base, the tax base, and lower the burden on the middle class. Everybody pays. Those that oppose the fair tax, well, if your income is derived from the current tax code, we've got lobbyists and politicians. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're going to have to find a job, <laughs> another job. Uh, basically, Neil Ward's even said that the fair tax is going to be the greatest shift of power from the government to its people since the Declaration of Independence. And that is pretty profound. When you get to keep 100% of your earned income, that is, that is, that's a lot of power. And 
Right now, I mean, the second demand in the Communist Manifesto is what? A graduated income tax system. The government has a boot on the throats of businesses and individuals in this country. And it's choking the life out of us. We've got to remove the IRS. We've got to repeal the 16th Amendment. We've got to tap into these revenue streams. The fair tax is also revenue neutral. And uh, also $22 million started off the research to find out all of this information. And it's the most researched piece of legislation regarding tax reformation in American history. And the research continues today. The Beacon Hill Institute has uh, crunched the numbers for the states. We have uh, state-specific numbers for Louisiana. And uh, last year, I actually ran for state representative with the fair tax as my platform and how we can end the income tax for the state of Louisiana. And actually, the, the fair tax would be less than 1%. It's 0.9% for the state of Louisiana. Some of the resources uh, that you can find out, basics, more of the basics um, of the fair tax, the fair tax book by Neil Bortz and Congressman John Linder. And uh, then they came out with uh, Fair Tax the Truth, uh, which was a follow-up book to that, which basically took all the arguments that people had and all the questions, further questions that people had and answered all of that. And then we have the Fair Tax Solution, which just came out a couple of years ago. And uh, those three books are really good uh, to look for more information. We do have fairtax.org, fair which is our uh, fairtax.org, which is our website. And we also have uh, industry reports on the website where research is done for every aspect of our economy, our way of life in America. Everything from charitable giving to agriculture to uh, your, your pocketbook. Um, any, any part, any aspect of American life has been researched how the fair, and how the fair tax um, uh, affects it will all, is all laid out in, in those reports. We also have a fair tax calculator where you can plug in your income, how much you spend every month on certain things, how much you give to charities. All, everything that, every dime that you spend, you calculate it in there and it'll tell you how the fair tax will affect you personally. And that's basically the, the main components of the bill. H.R. 25, Senate Bill number 13. Uh, it's been there since 1999, so I hope you guys will check it out, look at the details a little bit more. Uh, Governor Gary Johnson will probably explain to you more about how he's incorporating it into his platform. Just remember, it's a freedom bill. Uh, repealing the 16th Amendment, getting rid of the IRS, and uh, allowing you to keep your earnings. Uh, what we want to do is we want to spend, save, and invest without the government being the middleman uh, between you and your earnings. And that's about it. And then we'll have the Q&A session afterwards. <coughs> Okay, great. We're going to be continuing uh, all of our program tonight. Our next speaker is the author of such works as The Privatization of Roads and Highways, uh, one of my personal favorites, Defending the Undefendable. He is the Harold E. Worth Eminent Scholar, Endowed Chair, and Professor of Economics. Please welcome Dr. Walter Walk. Thanks for the kind introduction. Can you all hear me in the back? Everybody okay? Good. It's my honor and privilege to introduce Gary Johnson, who is running for the presidency of the United States. He's running on the Libertarian Party ticket. So I thought I would have a, a little bit of an introduction into what is libertarianism. A lot of people confuse it with libertinism or librarianism. Uh, 
<laughs> even some old hands in libertarian uh, theory might uh, benefit from hearing again what is the essence of libertarianism. The way I see it, uh, libertarianism is sort of like a coin. And on one side of the coin is the non-aggression principle, and on the other side is private property rights. So what is the non-aggression principle? The non-aggression principle is keep your bloody mitts to yourself. Don't grab other people's property or, or, their, uh, or their persons without their permission. Very simple. Uh, you need private property rights because if I come into the audience and grab your shoes, am I violating your property rights? Well, that depends upon who the rightful owner of the shoes is. If you stole them from me yesterday, then it's okay for me to grab them. If not, not. So private property rights and the non-aggression principle are the opposite sides of the same coin. Why is libertarianism important? It's important because it's barbaric. It's uncivilized to uh, not adhere to these principles. I mean, most people, most decent people, your neighbors, your friends, uh, your family members, they, they don't punch each other out. They, they don't steal. They don't rob. Uh, th this is just what civilization means. It's an attack on barbarism. Uh, the only difference between us libertarians and them are folk who uh, may pay some lip service to uh, the non-aggression principle and private property rights is that we're really serious about it, whereas they are not quite so serious about it. Why is it important? Well, if we have libertarianism, we'll have peace and prosperity. And peace and prosperity is pretty important. Everyone says they're against poverty, they're against unemployment. Well, these things are caused by violations of the non-aggression principle. Uh, and if we got rid of those violations, we would have peace and prosperity and uh, an end to poverty. I'm often fond of saying that uh, if it weren't for the government, we'd have cured cancer and we'd have uh, stopped things like uh, uh, Katrina. Why? Because they take half the GDP away from us and spend it on all sorts of um, fripperies. And if we had had that half of the GDP, we might have done who knows what. So I blame them for bad weather and um, <laughs> everything. I want to address several audiences in an attempt to get the most votes that we can for the uh, Johnson Gray ticket. The first audience I want to address is libertarian non-voters. It's only libertarians who would be against voting. I mean, Democrats are in favor of voting, and Republicans are in favor of voting, but libertarians, or at least some of them, are against voting. And what they think is that uh, this violates the non-aggression principle. If you just press a lever and vote for somebody, it's equivalent to uh, rape or murder. I mean, that, that's just silly. The other argument that they have is, well, you're giving sanction to the state, you're supporting the system, you're supporting the man, you're supporting imperialism, whatever. Uh, it's not a violation of the non-aggression principle. Yes, it does give some sort of sanction. You know, there's that bumper sticker, don't vote, it just encourages them. <laughs> well, but if we were to seriously take that view to heart, namely that we couldn't violate, uh, we couldn't give sanction to the government in any way, well, how did you all get here tonight? Didn't you use public roads? Uh, we, we couldn't get here without public roads, so if you don't want to give sanction to the state, you shouldn't use public roads. Most of you have got fiat currency in your wallets. That's government currency. You're giving sanction to them. Most of us have eaten within the last couple of years. Uh, <laughs> the government subsidizes agriculture, so we shouldn't eat, and we shouldn't have clothes, and we shouldn't have shelter. So what I'm trying to do is make a reductio ad absurdum uh, for this idea. By the way, I have to put in a little plug for Loyola University vis-a-vis um, LSU. Now, you guys might beat us in football, but that's mainly because we don't have a football team. If we did, God is on our side, so you know, we can probably beat you. Uh, on a more serious note, I took an informal survey of uh, how many libertarian professors there are at LSU, and there are some thousand professors in the whole place, and uh, the, uh, my uh, correspondent said maybe one or maybe two. That one or two out of a thousand is one-tenth of a percent. That's pathetic. Whereas in Loyola, ta we should have a drum, <laughs> drum roll here, uh, we have about 10 out of about 250, which is 2%, which is gigantic for most places. In my own economics department, all five of us are sympathetic to Austrian economics and libertarianism. So if any of you are sick of your painting professors, if any of you are sick of your Keynesian Marxist professors, come on down to Loyola transfer, get your younger brothers or sisters to come on down and study with me and my colleagues. 
Okay, so I don't think it's against uh, rights uh, deontologically, it's uh, legitimate to vote. And then the question is, well, is it pragmatic? Is it utilitarian? Will it help us? I think to ask that question is to answer it. I mean, uh, Ron Paul, when he'd go to a university campus, would get thousands of people, and Gary Johnson hopefully will get many more people because he's voting, uh, he's running for a libertarian party. Murray Rothbard used to say, that every four years, the, the guy whose favorite thing is to watch TV or football or something like that, bowling, uh, every four years they pay attention to politics. So we might as well try to promote liberty in this way. So I think it's uh, wonderful to have uh, people uh, vote, and, and I reject this idea. Okay, my second audience that I want to address is Ron Paul supporters. Now, I'm a Ron Paul supporter. My most recent book is a book, uh, my love letter to Ron Paul. It's uh, Ron Paul and Liberty. It's available for commercial message here on uh, Amazon.com. Everybody buy that book. It's a great book. I'm, I'm a staunch Ron Paul advocate. And Ron Paul had his chance, and he promoted liberty in a magnificent way. But now it's Gary Johnson's turn. So we've got to support him, and there are a lot of Ron Paul people that say, well, you know, we really shouldn't support uh, Gary Johnson because, well, Gary Johnson isn't a, a pure libertarian. That's one argument. Well, you know, if you get 10 libertarians in a room, you're going to get 11 opinions. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I sometimes think the only pure libertarian is me, and I'm not even sure of myself sometimes. So th this hyper, super duper, uh, uh, you know, you got to be perfect on every thousand issues so you have to have, have the libertarian line. It's just silly. Uh, you know, libertarians, moving libertarians along is like herding cats. We all are independent. We have different views. So yes, I disagree with uh, Ron Paul on one or two issues. I disagree with Gary Johnson on one or two issues. That doesn't matter. I think uh, we owe our support to him. Uh, some people say that um, uh, it's a wasted vote. If you vote for Gary Johnson, it's a wasted vote because uh, either Obama or Romney is going to win, and if you vote for him, it's, it's a wasted vote. I don't think so. I think that, uh, you know, the usual libertarian candidate gets about 1% of the vote, or a half a percent, or a percent and a half, or something like that. But Gary Johnson, I think, has a much better chance, especially if he rides the tidal wave of Ron Paul supporters, which is why I'm trying to reach out to Ron Paul supporters and ask them to support Gary Johnson. Uh, if, if he can get 10% of the vote, if he breaks into double digits, uh, this will promote liberty. This will keep liberty on, on the map. Uh, if he just gets more than the difference between Romney and Obama, uh, th this will help as well. It will keep liberty on the map. It will keep it uh, on people's um, uh, tongues. Look, the only way we're going to get a libertarian society, the only way we're going to get peace and prosperity is to get a lot of libertarians. And who is out there getting libertarians? Right now, it's, it's Gary Johnson. So I think we have to support him. I think that um, there are other reasons why we should, uh, we should support Gary Johnson. Um, some people say, well, let's write in Ron Paul's name on the ballot. Well, this will just be ignored. Look, the, the only reason Ron Paul isn't in there is because Romney cheated him out of uh, what he was uh, rightfully due. And the people who count these votes. votes will just ignore writing in Ron Paul. So writing in Ron Paul might be satisfying to some people, but I think voting for Gary Johnson makes a much bigger and better statement for libertarianism. Some people say, well, if we vote for Gary Johnson, we'll take votes away from Romney. Well, if anyone deserves to have votes taken away from I tell you, the 2008 uh, vote, I favored Obama over McCain, because I think, uh, even though McCain was slightly better on economics, uh, I, I thought Obama was better on foreign policy. Uh, I thought McCain was going to drop an atom bomb on someone, and I didn't like the idea of dropping atom bombs on people, so I uh, sort of held my nose and supported uh, uh, um, uh, 
what's his name? Uh, Obama. <laughs> I'm an absent minded professor. I have uh, mental glitches every once in a while. Well, I also support uh, Obama over Romney because I think that, I mean, Romney wants to uh, pick a fight with China. I mean, he, I, I don't understand that. I mean, they have a billion and a half people. Why, why don't we pick on someone less, less than our size? I mean, it's just crazy to, uh, to pick a fight with China because they're exporting goods or something like that. Uh, so I really think that if, if I had a choice between Romney and Obama, I would pick Obama. So therefore, if Gary Johnson takes more votes away from Romney and, and Obama wins, it doesn't bother me in the, in the slightest. Happily, we don't have to have only a choice between Obama and Romney. Who knows? Mary, uh, Gary Johnson could win. Uh, you know, there are various scenarios. You know, both of them get caught in bed. What is it? With a dead boy or a live girl or something? I forget how that goes. Uh, anything is possible. reasons for voting for Gary Johnson, and let me break them down into economics, personal liberties, and foreign policy. Gary Johnson is the only one who would pull the troops out of Afghanistan. What in bloody blue blazes are we doing there? We're trying to export democracy? What's so great about democracy? I mean, Hitler came to power in a democratic uh, vote. Uh, or through a democratic process. Uh, he didn't win through a coup d'etat. I'm, I'm in favor of democracy. I'm not in favor of uh, totalitarianism, but we have to realize that democracy is just, uh, what is it, a futures market in stolen goods, no man's uh, lives or property is safe when the legislature is in, in session. Uh, okay, we're in favor of democracy, but we're not, I don't think libertarians are in favor of forcing democracy on people at the point of a gun. And then when they vote wrong, like when the Arab street votes for people we don't like, uh, we're sort of caught up in a, in a bit of a contradiction. On economics, Gary Johnson is magnificent. He favors uh, private property rights, he favors uh, much less regulation, he favors uh, much lower taxes, much lower government spending. The other two are, uh, are just horrible. At least we can sort of count on, on Obama. We know that he's a socialist and he's consistent. <laughs> but with Mitt Romney, we don't know what we're going to get. I mean, you know, uh, is it this Romney or that Romney? There, there was this uh, wonderful um, uh, ad that I saw, you know, Romney is taking every view on every issue and he keeps changing. <laughs> so, uh, we don't know what he's going to do. He also favors the minimum wage law. And for me, as an economics professor, that's almost like a litmus test. You know, he's supposed to be good on economics and he favors the minimum wage law as a way of curing uh, unemployment. That, that's just uh, crazy. Another reason to vote for Gary Johnson is that he supported Ron Paul in 2008. And yet another reason to support Gary Johnson is that when Gary Johnson was on, I think, one or two of the Republican uh, debates, and they were all asked, well, who would you pick, if you were picked for president, who would you pick for vice president? Well, who did Gary Johnson pick for his vice president? Ron Paul. That alone endears him to me. I mean, if he were bad on everything else, I, I would uh, love the man for that, because anyone who likes Ron Paul, um, I'm with. So, uh, Gary Johnson has got a long record of supporting uh, uh, Ron Paul and Ron Paulism and, and libertarianism. He certainly favors personal liberties, uh, legalizing marijuana and other victimless crimes. <laughs> and, and here we have to distinguish libertarianism from libertinism. Look, when we say we favor the legalization of victimless crimes like drugs, power, uh, prostitution, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, pornography, uh, gambling, things like that, it doesn't mean that we favor doing those things. It just means that we favor not putting people in jail for doing that. Look, I have a daughter. The last thing I'd want is for her to be a prostitute. God forbid she should be a prostitute. But if she did become a prostitute and she limited herself to consenting adults, I wouldn't want her to be put in jail for it. 
I have a son. I wouldn't want him to take uh, drugs unless maybe it's uh, medical marijuana for health purposes. I'm not enough of, enough of a doctor to know whether that's good or not. But if he did, I wouldn't want him to put him in jail. So a lot of people confuse us with libertines and they think, well, since you want to legalize drugs, you want everyone to use it and everyone to become drunk or something. And that, that's just uh, nonsense. We favor the legalization, but not necessarily the use. We have no view qua libertarian as to whether you should use it or not. That's uh, for your personal morality and what have you. And on uh, foreign policy, uh, he wants to bring the troops home. Uh, we have, what is it, uh, 1,000 military bases uh, in 150 foreign countries. I'm not sure if I've got those numbers right. And these uh, people have the audacity to say that that's defense? That's not defense, that's offense. Look, uh, when we uh, have basketball uh, games, uh, everybody in the audience knows when they yell defense, when the other team's got the ball. Somehow we can't figure it out with military. I don't understand that one. Let me uh, end by talking about drug, the drug war, because here I think uh, Gary Johnson is absolutely heroic. When he was governor, he favored the legalization of marijuana. That means a lot. First of all, the Harrison Narcotics Act of 1917 is a deeply racist law. It was an attempt to undermine the Chinese. Uh, in 1917, there was an anti-Oriental uh, animosity, and they noticed that the, uh, these people went to opium dens, which didn't make them violent, they just sort of got sleepy or something, and that's what they liked, and, and we had to disaccommodate them by declaring it illegal. So it was an anti-racist uh, kind of a law. And now it's very anti-racist because it disproportionately hurts black people. Young black men are disproportionately in jail or dead because of this. And somehow the returns are considered racist or something, which is nonsense. I mean, Obama is supposedly one of the leaders of the black community. I tell you, if I were a leader of a, a, a libertarian community, which I'm not, and young male libertarians were dying like flies, I would sort of say, well, you know, maybe we ought to rethink this. The NAACP is maybe, maybe thinking about this, and there is some black woman who just wrote a book saying that the, uh, the law is racist. But we libertarians have been talking about this for years and years and years. nothing from prohibition. You know, I tell my classes, have we learned nothing from North Korea versus South Korea, East Germany versus West Germany? Both of these countries had similar kinds of people, but because of an act of war, uh, they had a very different economic system. The North and South Koreans, the East and West Germans had the same culture, the same language, the same people, the same pretty much everything. And one of them adopted one policy, and they're practically starving, and, and the traffic from East Ger was from East Germany to West Germany, and not the other way around, and similarly from North to South Korea. Haven't we learned anything from that? And I also say, haven't we learned anything from alcohol prohibition? We had alcohol prohibition, and we had bathtub gin. Uh, Lenny Bruce, one of my heroes, died of, uh, of an overdose or a horrible uh, uh, poisoned uh, uh, al uh, alcohol. Sorry, I'm confusing. He, he died from um, uh, poisoned drugs. Another uh, problem with this uh, law is that the addicts use shared needles, and when they have shared needles, this uh, promotes uh, this promotes AIDS. So. I think that uh, Gary Johnson is magnificent and heroic, and I now introduce the next president of the United States, Gary Johnson. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. So, I think the country is in deep, deep doo-doo. <laughs> and to get out of this, it's going to involve mutual sacrifice on all of our parts. And I want to stress mutual. We have to be engaged in this. I think you have to have a resume uh, to run for President of the United States. I think I have a resume that would suggest that not only can I do this job, but that I can do a really good job at it. And let me start with the fact that I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. 
I started a one-man handyman business when I was a junior in college in 1974, me, and actually grew that business to employ over a thousand people in New Mexico. Electrical, mechanical, plumbing, pipe fitting. Yeah. A testament to a whole bunch of really hard-working people, a testament to good work ethic, showing up on time, keeping your word, doing a little bit more for people, than what you said you would do for them. Anyway, I sold that business in 1999. Nobody lost their job. They're doing better than ever. And, and it allows me to have a full-time, unpaid job running for President of the United States. <laughs> uh, I am also an athlete, and I think this is important. Uh, what athletics has taught me is that life is a journey, it's not a destination. You really have to enjoy your life. You have to get up every single day and enjoy what you do. And if you're not doing that, let me just offer you a suggestion. Change your life tomorrow. You're the movie producer, you're watching the movie. If there's anything you don't like about you up there on the big screen, there's one person in control of that. So, that said, um, I've climbed Mount Everest. And I say this from a humble standpoint. I say this from a humble standpoint. People say, no, people say you conquered Mount Everest. I did not conquer Mount Everest. She lifted her skirt. We had a really great day. She gave us all a peek. It was terrific. But the Mount Everest trip for me kind of symbolizes my life. It's a journey. It's not a destination. So I was fit enough to go there in the first place. I had the resources to be able to go there. I broke my leg six weeks before leaving for Nepal. I left for Nepal with a broken leg, believing that it would heal by the time we got around to summit day. When I broke my leg, I was faced with a couple of things. One is not to go to Mount Everest. The other is, this is just as, this is the way life works. Everything that you think is going to happen, you know, nothing works out as planned. And you can lay on the couch and below that, or you can take control of it and move forward. Well, I'm a guy who takes control of it and moves forward. I had never been involved in politics prior to running for New Me uh, governor of New Mexico. I mean, not at all. Complete outside. I went and I introduced myself to John Latuzio, who was the chairman of the Republican Party, two weeks before I announced my candidacy for governor. You know what he says? He says, wow. Kevin, I like you. I like what you've got to say. You know, we're inclusive. We're going to include you in all the debates, all the discussions, all the meetups. You can travel around the state. We'll hook you into all this. You can make your pitch to people. Uh, who knows? You might win the nomination. But you'll never get elected governor of New Mexico in a state that's two to one Democrat being completely outside the process. It's not going to happen. Well, I got elected. I'd like to think it was based on what I had to say, which was, hey, how about bringing a common sense business approach to state government? Best product, best service, lowest price. Less government is better government. Let's keep government out of the bedroom. Let's leave personal choices to me, and let's, uh, let's make government as efficient as we possibly can from a dollars and cents standpoint. I just think that what speaks volumes is the fact that I got re-elected by a bigger margin the second time than the first time in a state that is two to one Democrat. <laughs> two polls and one study over the last year. The first one was a poll that was what are the favorabilities of all the presidential candidates in their own states, his or her own states? There's only one presidential candidate that was viewed favorably in his or her own state, and that was me. How does that work out in New Mexico? Well, in a state that's two to one Democrat, I make a name for myself being a penny pincher. In New Mexico, people wave at me with all five fingers, not just one. <laughs> and then there was a study on job creation. Which presidential candidate had the best record when it came to job creation? Well, that was me. And my response to 
of that was the same as it was when I was governor of New Mexico. I didn't create one single job as governor of New Mexico. Government doesn't create jobs, the private sector does. But, but I controlled all the agencies. I appointed the heads of all the agencies. I appointed all the boards and commissions. I control all rules and regulations. And I want to suggest to you that rules and regulations got better on a daily basis. And that daily basis was just a root in common sense. You know, less time, less money to have to comply with government. As governor of New Mexico, I may have vetoed more legislation than the other 49 governors in the country combined. I vetoed 750 bills while I was governor of New Mexico. I had thousands of line item vetoes. I took line item veto to a new art form in New Mexico. It made a difference when it came to billions of dollars worth of spending. It made a difference when it came to government telling you and I what we have to do. And in most cases, really, it was just going to add time and money to our lives. It wasn't going to make us any more safe. It wasn't going to make us any healthier. You know what? I stood up and vetoed that legislation. Lastly, they came out uh, uh, with a report. The ACLU came out with a report card last December on all of the presidential candidates. And the ACLU, a group dedicated to the Constitution, a group dedicated to, to the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, a group dedicated to civil liberties. I think this is really important. The ACLU comes out with a report card. 24 Liberty Torches is a perfect score. 24 Liberty Torches, perfect score. Mitt Romney and Rick Santorum, zero Liberty <laughs> Torches out of 24. <laughs> Newt Gingrich, four Liberty Torches out of 24. Barack Obama, 16 Liberty Torches out of 24. Ron Paul, 18 Liberty Torches out of 24. And Gary Johnson, 21 Liberty Torches. So I'm on the ballot right now in 47 states and the District of Columbia, and we are litigated in those three states where I'm not on the ballot. We think that we're going to prevail in those three states. But there are, I want to, I want to point this out, there are other third-party candidates, but none of them are going to come close to 50 ballot state access. None of them. I think the Green Party is going to be qualified in 30 states, Constitution Party, other parties. We're, talk we're talking about just a handful, 10 maybe. So when I talk about myself and my opponents, I'm going to talk about Mitt Romney and Barack Obama because it's going to be the three of us that are on the ballot in all 50 states. So there are some big differences between myself and my opponents. Big differences. Big, big differences. And let's start with Iran. I'm the only candidate that does not want to bomb Iran. If we bomb Iran, we're going to find ourselves with another 100 million enemies to this country that we wouldn't otherwise have. Let's remember that after 9-11, the largest demonstration in the world in support of the United States was in Iran by over a million citizens of Iran that showed up in support of the United States. And we're going to bomb Iran? We're going to bomb these citizens? Right now, we have economic sanctions against Iran. You know that inflation in Iran right now is like 70% plus as a result of this embargo? Do you know what the result of that is? It's not the people resenting their government, it's the people resenting who's behind the embargo. And this is what we do continually. I'm the only candidate running for President of the United States that would get out of Afghanistan tomorrow and bring the troops home. Our military interventions have resulted in hundreds of millions of enemies to this country that but for our military interventions would otherwise not exist. Let's stop with the military interventions.
the root of all evil. Politicians beating their chests and talking about how they're going to save us from all the ills of the world. Just elect me or re-elect me. And in that vein, we're going to fight the terrorists. Wherever the terrorist is, well, the cost of that are, are tens of thousands of innocent people in these countries where we militarily intervene. And it's our men and service women coming back in body bags or with their limbs blown off. Let's stop with the military interventions in this world today. I'm the only... I'm the only candidate running for President of the United States who believes that marriage equality is a constitutionally guaranteed right. I'm the only candidate running for President of the United States who wants to end the drug war now, legalize Ninety percent of the drug problem is prohibition related, not use related. That is not to discount the problems with use and abuse, but that should be the focus. We are at a tipping point on this issue. Over 50% of Americans now support legalizing marijuana. Why is that the case? Because we're talking about it. And that's what we need in this country is a, a raging debate and discussion on all of these issues. But it's on the ballot in Colorado to regulate marijuana like alcohol. I think it has a great chance of passing. I think it's going to end up being the first of 50 state dominoes that are going to fall in line with rational drug policy. How's that going to work? Well, in Baton Rouge, after they've legalized marijuana in Denver, and everybody's getting on a plane to go to Denver for the weekend to chill out, that's the phenomenon that occurs, and 49 other states fall in line with that. And don't forget that in Colorado, six years ago, Denver citizens voted to decriminalize marijuana on a campaign based on marijuana being safer than alcohol. So they get it. How would it work out if you had a president that was willing to veto legislation all the time? Well, if I would have been president of the United States after 9-11, I would have never signed the Patriot Act. <laughs> I think that Homeland Security is incredibly redundant. And TSA, you know what? We should, we should have never established TSA. We should have left airport security. airlines, to the airports, to the states, to the municipalities. Uh, and by the way, if Congress doesn't, I'm President of the United States, Congress wasn't, doesn't want to abolish TSA, I'm President of the United States, I control all rules and regulations. I guarantee you, TSA will be less intrusive and as safe in a very, very short amount of time. Obama Romney want to sign the National Defense Authorization Act. I'm the only one who would not have signed the National Defense Authorization Act. Allowing for, for you and I to be arrested as U.S. arrested and detained as U.S. citizens without being charged. Isn't this why we fought wars in this world? I'm the only candidate running for President of the United States that is advocating balancing the federal budget now. I'm promising to submit a balanced budget to Congress in the year 2013, and that is mutual sacrifice on the part of all of us. And that means taking on the debate and the discussion that has to go along with significantly reducing Medicaid, Medicare, and military spending for starters. And by the way, Social Security is absolutely savable. It is a, it is a, a problem, an issue that is pale in comparison to Medicare. And right now, what do we have? We have Democrats and Republicans arguing over who's going to spend more money on Medicare. We have to significantly reduce 
the cost of Medicare, or we're going to find ourselves with no health care at all in this country. The result of continuing to borrow and print money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar we spend is going to be a monetary collapse. And a monetary collapse, very simply, is when the dollars that we have in our pocket don't buy a thing because of the accompanying inflation that goes along with borrowing and printing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar we spend. Crony capitalism is alive and well in this country. Loopholes are for sale. Both parties sell them, they got their hands out, individuals, groups, corporations pay for those loopholes. It's not a fair system. So I am the only candidate that is advocating eliminating the income tax, corporate tax, abolishing the IRS, and replacing all of that with one federal consumption tax. In this case, I am embracing the fair tax. It's really, it ends up being cost neutral, as you saw from Lauren's presentation, it ends up being cost neutral. It's really the answer when it comes to American jobs, because if in a zero corporate tax rate environment, the private sector doesn't create tens of millions of jobs, I don't know what it takes to create tens of millions of jobs. It's really the answer when it comes to American exports, because you're going to bleed all existing federal tax out of all goods and services for export. It's the answer when it comes to China. Um, and it's really the answer to fairness, just fairness uh, in this country. I'm the only candidate that would sign legislation abolishing the Federal Reserve if given the opportunity. It's an inside game when Treasury prints money, gives it to the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve gives it to the banks at 0%, the banks don't give it back to you or I, they buy up Treasuries in a closed loop, I mean this is Bernie Madoff with a printing machine, it's going to end, we need to balance the federal budget now. I'm the only candidate that would sign repeal of legal tender laws which would allow for competing currencies where we could actually have a basis in value to the dollars that we have. So, a couple of words about my opponents, and uh, let me just say something, that as governor of New Mexico, running for governor of New Mexico two times, I did not mention my opponent in print, radio, or television because I think people are really hungry to vote for somebody as opposed to the lesser of two evils. <laughs> Starting with President Obama, I gotta tell you, every word out of his mouth is like music. It's the violin playing. The words are fantastic. It's just there's a total disconnect between the words and the reality. And if I could just cite as an example, he promised he would not crack down on medical marijuana facilities in states where legislatures or citizens voted to implement these programs. He is cracking down much worse than George Bush. George Bush didn't crack down at all. He's cracking down on medical marijuana facilities in Colorado and California in opposite of what he absolutely promised to do. I just state of perpetual war, endless military interventions. Didn't you think that was going to get better? Um, he said a lot of things that I heard that I thought were very, very heartening. It's just that none of it has come to pass. And then Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney in the second debate said, it's a no-brainer to build a fence across the border. I have to tell you all that you are listening to someone who does not have one molecule of brain based on Mitt Romney's statement. Don't build a fence across the border. Let's make it as easy as possible for someone who wants to come into this country and work to get a work visa. Would immigrants stand in line if the line was moving to get a work visa? Yes, and that's the issue. The line's not moving. And so they come across illegally because they know the jobs are there. They would stand in line. And for the 11 million illegal immigrants that are here in this country right now, 
let's set up a grace period. We don't want to be breaking up families. Let's adopt the fair tax. Then taxes aren't an issue at all because whether you're illegal, legal, a visitor to the United States, a U.S. citizen, nobody is going to be able to avoid paying one federal consumption tax. And then I'm back to legalizing marijuana. Legalized marijuana, and arguably 75% of the border violence with Mexico goes away. That being the estimate of the drug cartels' activities that are engaged in marijuana. We've had 40,000 deaths south of the border over the last four years. These are disputes that are being played out with guns rather than the courts. I guess we didn't learn anything when it came to the prohibition of alcohol, where disputes were played out in the streets as opposed to the courts. Mitt Romney says, we need to balance the federal budget but we need to hold Medicare intact and we need to increase our spending when it comes to the military. I'm going to make an assumption here that everybody graduated from the second grade and the mathematics that you had to become proficient in to graduate from the second grade, it doesn't add up. And he's supposed to be a smart guy, but it just doesn't add up. I think the stakes here, this election, are really, really huge. This monetary collapse is going to happen sooner than later. So something that I hear all the time is uh, wasting your vote. Isn't wasting your vote voting for somebody you don't believe in? Isn't that wasting your vote? We change things in this country by voting for somebody that we believe in, and that's how we change things. And I want to tell you, if you haven't already noticed, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. And so I am really heartened by this campaign. Right now, nationally, I am polling at 5 or 6 percent nationally. Let me ask you this. Do you hear my name five times every time you hear Obama or Romney's name a hundred times? No. You might hear my name one time for every 5,000 times you hear Obama's name or Romney's name. So if I were just being reported for where I'm at, just if, if, if I was honestly reported from where I, I'm at, if my name was mentioned five times for every time these guys' names were mentioned a hundred times, I wouldn't be at 5%, I'd be at 8, 11, 18, I would be the next president of the United States. Yeah. This is a 40 uh, campus tour, uh, campus and university tour by myself and my running mate, Judge Jim Gray. Uh, why are we going out to talk to colleges and universities? Because I think young people, more than any other group, understand just how screwed we all are. <laughs> and talking about you all as young people, I'm going to retire, I'm going to have health care, but you're not going to have health care. You're not going to ever be able to retire paying all this back. You're graduating from college uh, with, a, uh, with uh, college loans. Uh, that I'm going to suggest to you the high cost of tuition has everything to do with government guaranteed student loans. But if government guaranteed student loans didn't exist, tuition would be much, much, much lower. And here it is, our military interventionist policies. Well, who goes over there and fights these wars? It's young people that take it on the chin for all this. And then President Obama's health care plan. It's, it's, it's based on healthy people buying insurance that they weren't buying before to pay for those that aren't so healthy. Well, guess what the healthy group is? It's young people. So young people, I think, are in a state of revolt. I hope it ends up being an open revolt before this next election, because these issues are way, way too important. When I hear a politician say, we can't leave this to our kids or our grandkids. It's here. It's now. And it has to get dealt with now. And it's not being dealt with now. So I want to make a request to all of you. And that request is, waste your vote. And vote for me.
if you will all do that, I'll be next president of the United States. And I guarantee you that these issues will get addressed. And I guarantee you, you waste your vote on me, I guarantee you it is nothing that you will ever regret. Thank you very, very much. We get to do uh, questions, comments, uh, any insults. <laughs> okay, throughout this evening, we've been taking your questions via Twitter, via the hashtag LSUVotes. Uh, if you want to continue to submit your questions, we will ask you the best ones for the governor. Our first question. Our first question comes from Billy Jacobs. You say you want to legalize marijuana. Do you support legalizing all drugs? If no, then why? Well, if we legalized all drugs tomorrow, the world would be a much, much better place. No ifs, ands, or buts. But I don't think we as a nation go from where we're at right now to legalizing all drugs. I think where we go from where we're at right now is legalizing marijuana. I think we're at a tipping point on this issue. I think when we do that, I think this country takes giant strides toward recognizing rational drug policy, which starts from looking at drugs as a health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. Portugal, uh, Holland. Portugal decriminalized all drugs 10 years ago in response to a heroin epidemic. In the last 10 years, heroin use in Portugal has dropped 50%. Kind of flies in the face. When you look at Portugal and Holland, uh, each of these countries has 60% of the drug use as that of the United States. Now that's on a per capita basis, but that's marijuana, that's hard drugs, that's kids, and that's adults. I say we legalize marijuana, uh, and I say we take giant steps toward the end goal, which is the whole notion that this is a health issue. This is not a criminal justice issue. For anybody that says, you know, this is condoning drug use among kids. I don't want my kids to use drugs. No parent wants their kids to use drugs. But thats it's a family issue. It's an issue that needs to be dealt with with families. And you enter the criminal justice system, it's just worse. The criminal justice system is 90% of the problem. Our second question comes from Evan Revere. How would you have handled the recent attacks on the U.S. Embassy in Libya? How would I have handled the recent attacks in, uh, on our embassies? I would uh, vacate our embassies right now. <laughs> Why are we setting ourselves up as targets in an area that is that really needs targets? Uh, that's not a show of strength. That's a show that I think we actually have brains. And what are vital American interests? I, I please, anybody knows, uh, let, let me know what that is. And then in Syria right now, we're backing the insurgents in Syria, and a quarter of the insurgents are Al-Qaeda. The story goes on and on and on. And didn't we do that in, in Afghanistan? And wasn't that the roots of Osama bin Laden? On and on and on. Staying with foreign policy, our next question is, what would the Johnson administration stance be on instances of free speech which allegedly sparked third world outrage? Well, that we're not a democracy. We're a we're a constitution. We're a republic, and we're governed by laws. And that, well, those laws are the Constitution of the United States. This is why we have fought wars. So, free speech is 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 fundamental. Now, do we agree with free speech? No. But what we what we do in this country is we stand up for the right of anybody uh, to express their opinion. Our 
next question comes from Colin Prestige. Is the current healthcare system adequate? Do you agree with Romney that the emergency room is a good option for the uninsured? <laughs> Look, I absolutely believe in free market approaches to healthcare. That said, healthcare in this country is about as far removed from free market as it possibly could be. Government, government passes laws that restrict our choices. Government passes laws that restrict the options that we have. Why don't we have 10 other options for the things that we face? Would I have health insurance to cover myself? Uh, would I have health insurance to cover myself for ongoing medical need in a country with a free market system for healthcare? No. I would have health insurance to cover myself for catastrophic injury or illness. And, I, and we all would pay as you go in a system that was really competitive. Advertised pricing. All sorts of different options that currently don't exist because legislatively, crony capitalism in the healthcare industry is alive and well. All legislation is about restricting our options so that those that are currently involved in delivering those options uh, have, a, have a lock. Uh, so, Genuine free market approaches to healthcare, something that does not exist today at all. When the whole, when the whole healthcare debate started, I had envisioned gallbladders are us. Clinics that would specialize in gallbladder surgery at thousands of dollars as opposed to tens of thousands of dollars. Why is that so far fetched? And when Romney talks about emergency rooms, what's so far-fetched about clinics all over the place to deal with urgent care? And I know there are urgent care clinics, but you go into the urgent care clinic, and I, I, I'm going to bet the person at the desk is not going to be able to tell you what it's going to cost you to come in there and visit. Advertised pricing. You know, $15 gets you, uh, uh, gets you into the urgent care clinic. If anything's prescribed, maybe it goes up to 35. I'm just saying, here, man, this is an exciting notion. Criticism in this country of free market is never criticism of free market. It's criticism of corporate welfare. It's criticism of crony capitalism. Most people believing that that's free market when it has nothing to do with free market. Our next question comes from Justin Kilpatrick. Um, how would you lower the cost of the university? Are you state differently? What could the federal government do to make education more affordable for college students? Look, right now, kids, kids look at the high cost of tuition. Let me just guess that you know, fifteen thousand dollars is a semester, and and you're a young person, and you're, I can't afford that. I can't afford that. I'm not going to go to school. I don't know what real benefit that might have. Well, you know that you can go to school because you're guaranteed a federally a federal um, school loan. That's the reason why college tuition is so high. If kids were making, if young people were making the choice to not go to school because it costs so much, guess what would happen to the cost? It would dramatically come down. But. Uh, the government's made colleges and universities immune from that kind of uh, pricing. Our next question, what are your views on returning to a national gold standard? Very, very complex. Very, very complex. Extremely complex. But the way that you do that, the way that you get us to a a gold standard or a commodity-based currency is you allow for competing currencies. The government doesn't figure it out ahead of time. The private sector does. And you decide what you want to invest invest, and what, what currency would emerge. So that's how you establish that. And very, very complex regarding uh, commodity-based currency, gold-based currency, because gold is a, is, is a market-based uh, commodity. And so you have that working against, you know, the gas pump, and you're going to be very, very complex. But the private sector would work that out with, uh, with competing currencies. An exciting notion, in my opinion. Can 
Caitlin Turner asked, what's the best way to legalize same-sex marriage? Uh, recognizing that it is a constitutionally guaranteed right. Uh, that it is constitutionally based. If you take the position that this is, well, I, I think that fundamental to governance is strict adherence to the United States Constitution. I am believing that this is constitutionally based and that is the federal role in all this as opposed to the states. Uh, if you're going to leave this to the states, 42 states have now said that marriage is between a man and a woman. If you say you're going to leave this issue to the states, effectively you're not dealing with this issue. By the way, adopting the fair tax does away with over half the issues that go along with marriage equality. More than half the issues that have to do with marriage equality have to do with the uh, income tax code. Inheritance, uh, income. And our last question of this evening, are there any updates on your lawsuit to get into debates? How likely is it to succeed? Well, we filed suit. No, we're, not, we're, not, uh, we're not lying down on any of this. Uh, we filed suit on antitrust uh, grounds, which hasn't ever been tried before. Um, and um, we'll, we'll see. I just, I, I want you to believe that the person that you're listening to this evening, that there's no quit. There is no quit and um, that this is really, really important. I also recognize that um, if given the opportunity, there probably isn't anybody in this room that wouldn't take the opportunity that I've been given to be saying the same things that I'm saying. Uh, I'm trying to make the most out of this. Uh, back in uh, December, I really believe that uh, Ron Paul was not going to be the nominee of the Republican Party. Well, where does this voice go for liberty and freedom? It's going to be the Libertarian nominee for president. I saw an opportunity to be that nominee, and I just want you to know that I'm trying to make the best out of that opportunity. Let's also give a big round of applause to our other speakers, Ms. Laura O'Halloran. Thank you all for being a great audience tonight. We're going to hearing from our candidates and hearing about some of these ideas. After this event, uh, going on right now, uh, out in front of the lobby, we're going to have a brief meet and greet uh, with the governor. If you'd like to meet, shake hands, get your picture taken. For all the uh, LSU students in the crowd, if you're interested in fighting for these ideals on this campus all the time, the Young Americans for Liberty meet every Wednesday night in the Business Education Complex from 1835 at 6 p.m. And we're going to be doing a lot more things like this to keep the uh, crowd involved. So I look forward to seeing some of you at our next meetings. Good night.